Um, just a quick introduction. My name is uh, Richard Ko, and I'm the uh, chairperson for Singapore Computer Society um, Free and Open Source Software SIG, FOSS SIG, right? So um, a very warm welcome to our very first um, virtual meetup uh, is a webinar. Uh, this is our very first attempt uh, for the SIG to be running it virtually. Um, and the second for SCS, you know, uh, in their series of events. I hope um, everybody had a good day and Sorry. is keeping well. Sorry, do I hear someone? Um, it's, it's very unusual times uh, indeed. And um, really appreciates you taking time off, you know, from your day-to-day -day work uh, to join us here today. Yeah, and, and honestly, despite um, all these disruptions, I think one of the very core uh, facet of life is that you know, learning never stops, right? So uh, I hope with this uh, webinar, you know, we can share with um, everyone over here more cool open source technologies. You know, that is important to the enterprise important to your um, role, adding value to what you do in your organization. Yeah. Okay, so um, for starters, right, so, um, today's topic is um, about Apache Kafka. I, I believe, you know, many of you would have heard of Apache Kafka. Some of you might not have um, done so, which is, you know, the perfect uh, scenario for us over here. Um, it is a very popular you know, um, project un under the uh, Apache Software Foundations. In fact, it's the number two uh, most actively downloaded project. Um, today, we have about 100 over 1,000 organizations uh, using Apache Kafka for many, many different purposes, right? So as you may be aware, um, in the digital world, yeah. nothing, uh, uh, nothing is, you know, waits for one or the other, right? So everything happens in real time. Um, that is also the key uh, factor that is driving um, the move away from batch into more um, streaming kind of uh, environment. And, and Apache Kafka has been created just uh, specifically to address this issue, right? So um, today you, you can see organizations, you know, um, the likes of uh, LinkedIn, Uber, Netflix, uh, Spotify, Airbnb, Twitter, you, you name it, right? Uh, using um, this set of streaming technology to run their core business. And, you know, after hearing all this name, you might have the impression that, oh, you know, it's all the uh, digital natives, all the tech companies that is using uh, Apache Kafka. But I can assure you that, you know, you, you, you just need to do a quick Google and you will see many um, traditional enterprises as well as um, even the government agencies are moving into this space using streaming technologies, right? Traditional enterprises like um, the banks, the telcos, uh, retails, uh, manufacturing, you know, governments uh, specifically, you know, if you look at current situation with the uh, COVID, uh, you know, uh, infection developing, you know, real time capability is also very important, you know, to keep everybody updated at the most, uh, at the very instant, right, when uh, things happen. Yeah, so healthcare will be uh, needing this uh, critical set of uh, capability. Right? Um, I do see a number of people joining us from IHIS, you know. Um, very thankful for that. Yep. And um, with that as a background, right, um, I will uh, like to pass you over to Mark Dehan. Uh, Mark is our guest speaker today. You know, he works together with me, you know, uh, during office hours. Yeah? Uh, but today, uh, in today's world, office hours tends to extend <laughs> much later and it eats into the public holidays and, and weekends as well, right? So anyway, uh, Mark works for Confluence. He's our solutions engineer. Um, and you know, definitely he's going to cover a lot more about uh, Apache Kafka to the crowd today, um, talking about the origin, the state of where uh, of uh, where Kafka is today, and also the developments around this set of technology. Yeah. Um, to facilitate a smooth running of um, today's um, webinar, um, I would like to request that um, everybody please um, mute your mic. If you have questions, you know, um, that you would like to ask, when Mark is sharing, uh, please post them into the group chat. So at the end of the session, we will go into the group chat and answer uh, those questions accordingly. Okay, I, I hope that is fine for everyone. Uh, but if you really have uh, a need to speak, you know, you can uh, unmute yourself. Uh, nonetheless, you know, we will take those questions. Yeah. Um, so with this, I would like to hand uh, the screen over to Mark. Mark? 
Thank you very much, Richard. Thank you for the introduction. Um, hello, everyone. So today's talk is called The Rise of Real Time. Uh, and I'm your speaker, uh, solution engineer from Confluence. So it's about 30 or so slides and it will take 40 minutes or so. So we'll have time for questions in the end. And as Richard says, please post them into the chat and we can go through them afterwards. So first of all, a little bit about me. Um, I am a solutions engineer, which means I work as part of the sales organization, but on the more technical end of the scale rather than the salesy end. Uh, originally from Ireland, um, but I've been in Singapore since 2001. Um, so I originally came here to work on EasyLink, the project, um, via the, the contractor's ERG. So I've done some time over at LTA uh, and worked in EasyLink as well for the first few years. And then various stints in Credit Suisse and Royal Bank of Scotland. And then uh, most recently in SAP, where I ran the HANA Solution Center doing uh, proof of concepts for big database systems. So then I joined Confluent in 2018. I uh, was the first person in Confluent in uh, Asia Pacific. Uh, we've grown to a much larger team now, and of course, Richard's my colleague. Uh, my career background is mostly in all sorts of data. I've been a database administrator for most of that, either Oracle or SAP HANA, um, and all sorts of data. So both scalar data, geospatial, network data, um, text analytic data, all of these types. Um, and I do a lot of work on sort of demos, POCs, pilots, and evaluation of software on behalf of our customers. So uh, the premise of today's talk um, is following the theme that software architecture is mostly based on database principles. You know, and after 40 years, this is still very much the case and it's still going strong. So I'm going to make the case today that there's actually a missing ingredient in much of this approach. And it stifles the, the capabilities of um, building new systems. And this is really what Confluent is all about. Um, and the part that's missing really is events. It's as simple as that. Uh, if we were to define an event um, for this talk, it's really simply that something happened. That's what we're interested in today. Uh, um, an event records the fact that something happened. And if an event is that something happened, then really events are everywhere, okay? Um, and logically, a business is a series of events and the, the reactions to those events, okay? So let's talk a little bit about events themselves and why we think they're so fundamental to building systems. So every event has attributes, and one of those is the state or the status of an event. Um, and state, of course, can change, okay? But events, by definition, cannot change. They are immutable. Um, so supposedly we have a, a device that's emitting temperature. Uh, we get a reading a minute ago saying the temperature is 33 degrees. We get an, a, 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 a second reading saying that the temperature is 33.5 degrees. So the state has changed, the state being the temperature for this device. Um, so um, this would be expressed by sending two events to the event streaming system. And it's a very simple idea, um, the idea that data is continuously evolving. Um, the problem that we see is that many uh, software systems and, and particularly database-based systems handle this using an update rather than an insert. Um, uh, uh, much of software is written to, um, to overwrite, to, to record values as quickly as possible into the database. And often the case, that's an update rather than an insert. Um, so the, after the second event is received, we have recorded the temperature is 33.5 degrees, uh, probably in the table, saying the current state. 33.5 degrees, but somewhere else, somewhere deep in the database, we, have, we still have the 33 and the 33.5. We still have that actual stream of data. So we have this sort of duality between the table and the stream itself. Um, so state changes in databases take place using update, uh, delete, and insert statements, okay? And well, merge statements and the various other non-ANSI compliant ones, but basically, any of the SQL statements that would change data in a database. Um, but as I said, the, the original values are, do still exist somewhere, and it is possible to rebuild the current state of any event used by replaying the stream of the data. Okay? For, for those that are familiar with databases and know the structure of databases, you, know, you will know that the redo log for a database contains uh, all of the changes that have occurred to the database uh, in a, a fixed order. And indeed, the redo log is used for database recoveries. If ever you need to uh, uh, restore and recover a database, it will replay the redo log in order to, re to re uh, restore the state of the system. Um, 
So this idea is the, um, explored in depth by Confluent, and you will find a number of really good talks on this. I'd say most notably by Dr. Martin Kleppmann at the Kafka Summit talk. You can find it on YouTube. Uh, and he, he, he calls this the um, turning the database inside out, where we are, we're more interested in the redo stream from the database and the actual state that the database itself records. So it's an interesting idea that's closely related to events. Um, and this is why events are so fundamental, okay? Because you could represent all of your data as streams of events. Um, they're almost like a universal language for uh, continuously evolving data. Um, and different platforms will um, express their streams of events in different ways. Uh, as I said, a database will record that stream of events as a redo log. Um, and one of the interesting side effects of a redo log is you can reverse engineer it back into a stream again. So if you're using a, a CDC tool, a change data capture tool, you can recreate that stream of events um, by, by replaying the redo log. And all of the major redo, all of the major database vendors offer uh, change data capture tools. And again, this is an idea that's closely tied to event streaming systems because we are recreating the events that build up a database state. Okay, the second attribute of events is value. Okay. An event has value for each application that's interested in it. Um, a key thing to, to point out here is that event streaming systems share data. They don't distribute data. Um, some of this may seem familiar from the point of view of queuing systems, which have been around for a long time. And queuing systems distribute data. One end of the pipe publishes a message. Another end of a pipe subscribes to a message. And then the message is gone. Um, for event streaming systems, many systems can be interested in the same event. So for instance, if I'm processing payments as events, as soon as I produce a payment into it, my event streaming system, it may be consumed by uh, you know, a bank reconciliation application. It may be consumed by an auditing application. It may be consumed by a sales and marketing application that's interested in payments. So all of these will consume that event at the same time. And each one of these systems attaches a different value to that event. That's the second attribute. The third thing that's important about events is that they have two functions. Um, and this is, this is quite a subtle distinction, but it's important. The first is that the event itself triggers that something has happened, right? And the second is the event actually contains data because events are not data. Uh, sorry, events are not empty. They can be, but that would be kind of pointless. Um, so if we were to take a database analogy for, for this, it would be like doing an insert to a database of a row that's all nulls, which you can do. You can say invert into, insert into payments, value null, 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 et cetera, as long as you don't have any not null constraints on your row, it will let you do that. But nobody ever does that because it's pointless, right? The whole point of a database is that you're inserting the data as a single atomic unit. Um, but this, uh, this obscures the fact that um, that the, the, the act of doing the insert itself is actually an event, okay? And this is a, a distinction that's made much more clear with event streaming systems because um, you can have, you can insert a row for a payment or you can produce an event for a payment. Uh, once you've inserted the row, um, your data essentially becomes static. If you were to send that data to your platform as an event streaming platform, you can trigger pro downstream processing simply from the fact that you're sending an event into that topic. So again, it's, it's a subtle distinction, but it's, it's two different platforms and, and, and the different perspectives that these two platforms have for their data. So um, all of this leads me to conclude that, you know, events still don't have a proper home in infrastructure or in code. It's still difficult to find exactly where the events are. And that's because they are implicit. In the case of doing a database insert, the event is implicit in the fact that you ran an insert statement itself, okay? Um, but this, this really obscures the fact that, that uh, producing event in itself is, a, is, a, um, is, is of use to, to, to systems. Um, and now this, broad system platform classifications, I break systems down into three broad classifications. Um, I do a lot of work with organizations that are considering event streaming, but don't really know where it fits in. 
Um, and I, I usually use this analogy that, you know, every organization has a large estate of databases. Um, and, it, you know, it could be tens to hundreds to thousands of big banks have tens of thousands of databases, you know, Oracle SQL Server, Sybase, uh, um, DB2, et cetera, okay? Um, and, and that's, that, that's usually the lion's share of where data is stored in any organization. It's in a database somewhere. Um, most organizations have a big data platform of some sort, okay? It, be it a Hadoop-based system, an on-cloud-based storage system, a Spark-based processing system, but some form of data that's oriented towards big data. Um, and I, I'm, I make the case that there's actually a third classification of platforms that, that's really required, and that's an event streaming platform. Um, the, and, and the reason that, that um, companies are, are churning along quite happily without an event streaming platform is that they have really, they're running event streaming platforms in their database estate and in their big data estate. Um, and sort of usually struggling somewhat in order to achieve event like behavior from either of these two platforms. So I've done a lot of work with tuning like trading systems and um, you know, the sorts of systems that investment banks run. Um, and, and you can see the characteristics of when you're trying to achieve event-like behavior from a database because you end up um, giving a database huge resources. It could be a very large server, giving it a huge cache, very fast storage, um, and then uh, spending a lot of time and resources on database tuning, configuration, and then application tuning and configuration. And you've, you reach the final point where you're just really reducing the polling cycle of a query. You're making a query faster and faster and faster in, in order to get closer and closer to that real time goal. Um, and if you find that you're at this cursor level, trying to re-execute with as low latency as possible, it's really a case of a system that should be moved to an event streaming platform. It really no longer belongs on a database platform. Same goes for big data systems. There are a number of um, event streaming engines that run on big data systems, principally Apache Kafka. Um, but big data systems are oriented around storage. They're not oriented around events. And again, they're a poor fit for running an event streaming system. So what we tend to find is um, uh, Confluent uh, uh, work with organizations in order to classify how an event streaming platform fits into the organization and then which types of applications are better suited to to the event streaming platform and how to migrate them over from these other systems. So we're doing this with a number of organizations both here in Singapore and across uh, Southeast Asia at the moment, the areas that we cover. And retail is a super example of an event streaming business because really in retail, it's really clear that events are everywhere, right? Point of sale is an event. Every object that's in a basket is an event. Everything that happens at your warehouse and on a shelf and delivery and distribution centers, these are all events. On your digital channels, um, the, the, uh, all clicks for your website are events. And you can take this to, to literally an infinite degree where you're recording all pixel movement on your screen. Um, so it, it, you know, it, it makes it, it when, when I said earlier that business is really just a series of events, it should be very clear for retail businesses, um, you know, pr pretty much exactly what I mean. Um, the, the, but, the problem that we face is the infrastructure systems that we have today are not a neat fit for what we're trying to achieve here. You know, it's largely made up of tables, uh, of caches, either inside or outside the database and the applications that react to these. And these are basically data stores, okay? A lot of the role of a database is to make it seem like the data is not changing. It's trying to present to you a static view of the data. Um, and and the, the part that's missing from all of this is a, the event view of the data. Um, so you, you really need both perspectives in order to, to take advantage of the event streaming world. So tables represent the state of the world now and events are what has really happened in the world. And so databases really only make up half that story. You know, and in reality, databases are this way for a reason. I mean, databases have a job to do um, they have to answer questions about the state of the world as it is right now or the state of the world as it was at a point in time. And nobody ever comes to you and says that your database is too fast. All right, that's just not a, that's not a common characteristic for database systems. And that's because of the ever increasing volumes of data and the fact that you know, hardware resources remain static until you manually increase them. So databases are forever playing catch up uh, with increasing data volumes. 
Um, so uh, for the rest of this talk, I'm going to be speaking a bit about how the alternative way to do this, um, how we bring these two dualities of um, events and tables together. One of the worlds where this has been happening for quite some time is with microservices. Okay, microservices and events have always worked well together because event streaming systems are usually used as the processing platform and the communication between different uh, microservices. Um, and that's because the events are triggers. Okay, a microservice may emit a, may emit a sale event when a product is sold. Um, and another microservice may subscribe to this stream and in order to recompute the inventory based on the sale. Um, and it will emit a stream of events uh, representing new orders to place. This would be a very typical microservice plus event type of pattern. Um, and here, I've, we, you know, we've taken the same diagram, but I've, I've swapped out the microservices for databases. And remember I said earlier that redo logs for databases really are a, like a, a, a change log for everything that's happened on that database. All the inserts, deletes, updates, and merge statements for that database are, are in the redo log and they're time stamped and they're in order and they're immutable. Um, so using a change data capture tool, you can extract these back out of the database and replay them as a stream. And when you replay them as a stream, you can then feed them into applications such as microservices in order to achieve stream processing. Um, we do a lot of work with organizations like this because the reality is um, most, most core systems for organizations are, um, you know, they're, they're not easily changed, um, but there's, there's a necessity to, to um, get them talking to other types of platforms, to microservice platforms, to Lambda functions, to applications running on the cloud. And th th this problem exists of, of extracting data from legacy systems that are core to the business in order to feed uh, a new generation of systems that, that, that want to be more agile and more real time. And the way that we recommend to achieve this is by doing change data capture from core databases, feeding it through an event streaming platform and then okay. allowing uh, consumers from microservices or other systems to do this. And we go into this in a bit more detail as I get through the talk. So, What's it all, what, is this, what is this magical platform that I'm talking about? Of course, it's Apache Kafka, as Richard mentioned. Um, so a Kaf Kafka has been around now for 10 years or so, and it is the core of the event streaming platform that's promoted by Confluent. So the, the three engineers that uh, designed and uh, launched and built Apache Kafka um, 10 years ago were the founders of Confluent, the company that we're in today. Um, and the idea is of, uh, of Apache Kafka is that it can become this third platform in an organization, a central streaming platform that can be connected to all sorts of different systems. Um, and it's able to, to basically uh, centralize all sorts of data as events and share those events with all of these systems. So, Sharing data with a data warehouse implies that you're sending data to a database, which means we're going to have to send it in as SQL. Um, receiving data from SFDC or Salesforce means we're talking to a REST API. We need to receive the data from the REST and convert that into an event. Same for Bloomberg. No SQL databases and then interacting with all sorts of different types of applications from a central streaming platform. And you may think, oh, this is nothing new, right? This, is, this idea really has been around for a long time. Um, and it's true that it, uh, some of the concepts and ideas that I'm talking about have really been around for decades, right? Um, and the reality is that there are actually very few new, truly new ideas in software engineering now. Everything has been tried to some extent in the past, and this is no exception, right? There have been a number of, uh, there are a number of platforms out there that, that, you, can, that you can run that do Something similar to this, right? Queue-based systems have been around for a very long time. Tipco run, have a fantastic uh, uh, queue-based system, and it's uh, very revered and running in, in organizations all over the world in, um, as a, a mission-critical system. Same for IBM MQ. Uh, Informatica are one of the leading ETL companies that are able to move data between all sorts of systems as well. And this has been written about uh, as a research topic uh, in, in a number of publications before. Um, but there are a number of things that, that really make Kafka stand out from the companies that, that sort of 
uh, uh, released products in this space before. So Kafka originated in LinkedIn about 10 years ago. LinkedIn, if you cast your minds back to this time, it was a much more primitive site at the time, but they did actually pioneer the social media feed. Um, they, they call it the PYMK, the people you may know feed, uh, which is a, a, a complex uh, algorithm to, to compute and to present in a timely way to their users. Um, and 10 years ago, uh, when LinkedIn at the time, before they were, long before they were acquired by Microsoft, had a large estate of databases and you know, profile data, PYMK data, uh, uh, feed updates, et cetera, were stored in various databases and they wanted a way of building a social media feed that was dynamic and responsive and has become part of our daily lives for every social media platform now. Um, so they, they originally, the, the first uh, attempt at this was a database-based system and they decided that wasn't going to, to do what they needed to do to be really dynamic. The second attempt was using RabbitMQ. So they, they, they use a queue-based system and they had publishers and subscribers and subscribers have to be online and listening for their messages in order to, to react to them. And they decided that this was not the way they wanted to do it either. And they, they, they started developing, um, designing and developing a new system that was called, that became known as Kafka. Um, and I think in, in the great tradition of some Silicon Valley companies, they donated the source code to the Apache Software Foundation a year or two later. Um, so, you know, this, this is always a kind of an inflection point for companies that develop a really interesting software product. Do you, do you form a new IT JV to, to commercialize it or do you, you release it to the open source world? And they decided to release it to the open source world. Um, the Apache Software Foundation govern projects. There are hundreds of projects in there now. Uh, in reality, many projects go there to die. Um, but there are a number of projects that have become wildly successful and Apache Kafka as it's now known, is one of those examples. It has become wildly successful. Um, the initial success really came from a lot of digital natives from Silicon Valley that decided that they were going to become um, event-centric. Uh, and event-centric means that their data flows through event streaming systems and not through databases. As a, as a, uh, it's like being cloud first, but being event first. They, they, has, they still have lots of databases, many databases, but the, the, um, they, they build their architecture so that the, the data is first received as events and it flows into a database if it's needed in a database. Databases are very, very good at doing joins. They're very good at doing OLAP. They're do, good at doing OLTP patterns. Um, so data is only sent to a database if it's needed for a database workload. So. Um, all of these companies, and I think Uber really stands out here as a, as a company that really built an entire business on the principles of event streaming. Uber launched an application and a business that really took everyone by surprise. The idea that, that you could have a completely decentralized system um, where you have a very rich mobile application receiving data continuously from an event streaming system really showed the power of being able to uh, share massive numbers of events uh, with uh, huge numbers of producers and consumers. And, and it carried on. So over the years, um, I think uh, Apache Kafka sort of leaked out of Silicon Valley uh, usage. And now uh, we believe it's used by about 60% of Fortune 100 companies around the world. The actual number of companies with Apache Kafka running is, we don't know because we're not the Apache Software Foundation. Uh, we're, we're a company that, that contributes heavily to Apache Kafka, but of course we don't own Apache Kafka. But uh, we, we, we reckon that there are probably about 30,000 companies around the world that are running Kafka in production, and probably about 100,000 companies that use it in a lesser role of some sort. So it really has become huge. Um, and uh, the, it's, it's the success of Apache Kafka is largely because it's doing some things differently that the prior um, event streaming applications in the space we're not really doing before. And I'm going to look at three of these and then we're going to sort of get into the, um, into the Apache Kafka itself a little bit more. So a little, little bit more theory, I guess, behind um, Kafka itself. The first thing that Kafka gets right is its semantics or its meaning, okay? It's atomic broadcast. The, the, Kafka is I send it once and everyone gets it once. Um, remember how I described earlier that, that um, many systems may be subscribing 
two events at the same time. And this is the difference between sharing data and distributing data. Um, so queuing systems would distribute the data. They would send point to point. If I'm sending a payment to an audit system, I send it once. If I'm sending a payment to a um, to a, a, an accounts receivable system, then I would send it a second time, etc. That's not the way Kafka works. It does an atomic broadcast. It sends the message into a broker, and then all of the consumers that are listening to that topic will receive the message at the same time. Okay. So this is this is a, a an important design aspect of Kafka um, that that has made it different from queuing systems. The second is Kafka has powerful primitives around messages and streaming, okay? Instead of saying, here's a message, do something with it, uh, the Kafka way is here's an event stream, do something to it, okay? Um, Kafka stores the messages in an ordered log and then consumers will pick them up from that log. So uh, this in itself is, a, is a, an important difference with a queuing system. Que some queuing systems store uh, messages, but the general principle of queuing is once the message has been consumed by the subscriber, the message is gone. Some of them behave a little differently, but the general principle is that. Kafka is not that way, right? When you write a payment into a topic, as a producer, you don't care if, if it's picked up zero times, one time, or a million times. It doesn't matter to the data writer. You don't care how many times the data is read. And that's because Kafka writes the message down to disk and then it sends it out to all of the consumers that are listening to that message. So it means that there, there are a few characteristics to this. The first is because, we, it, because it writes messages to disk, we can replay messages. So we can go back and replay a stream in a similar way to a database recovery, right? Um, where we can kind of replay all of the activity in order, in order to rebuild the state for, for an object. So that's the first aspect. Sounds kind of interesting, but in reality, not many places do, do full replays of data. I would say with one exception, and that's machine learning. In order to train models, being able to replay a series of events is a, a really useful technique. Um, so, uh, but apart from machine learning, we don't tend to see replaying of events as, as being a super popular thing to do. What is really popular is that you can pick your events up later. You don't have to pick your event up now. So if I'm paying in payments and I'm doing 100 per second, I may have three applications that want these as fast as possible. These, these are event-driven applications um, and they're, they're, they're built about low latency and reacting to events. But I may also have a, a reconciliation report that runs daily. It starts up at 2 a.m. after a batch load has, has pumped out lots of data. And I don't want to run this application around the clock. I just want to run it at 2 a.m. because that, that's just the workflows that sit around it. And that pattern works too, because Kafka stores all of the events. The, the batch process will start up, it'll connect to Kafka. Kafka will say, okay, I know you, you were connected 24 hours ago. Here are all the events that have been produced into the topic since you last connected. It'll provide all the events in order so the application will catch up and then it can disconnect again and reconnect tomorrow. Okay, so this is also a powerful primitive and taking a, the, viewing the data as streams rather than viewing the data as messages. And the third and final difference really between Kafka and other uh, event streaming systems is just the scales that Kafka is able to operate at, right? Regarding scalability, elasticity, and multi-tenancy. Kafka can really go from really tiny systems that you can run in your MacBook to, to really some of the largest data processing systems in the world are Apache Kafka systems. So it uses a shared nothing cluster of brokers um, it runs best on modest Linux machines, small machines, usually 32 GB of RAM or on VMs, on Docker containers, on Kubernetes pods, on EC2 VMs, all of these are totally fine. Uh, it does run on Linux because it's a JVM based application. And usually the brokers have one TB to 16 TB of disk. Okay, so you start off with three brokers um, and you may be starting small. So supposing you have a system that's doing 100 invoices per day and you're feeding the invoices through Apache Kafka in order to share them with all of the applications that are interested in invoices. In that case, you're not interested in Kafka because it's, it's massive and it's able to do Uber-like or Netflix-like scales of data. You're interested in Kafka because it's very robust. It has guaranteed delivery. It has strict ordering of messages. Um, and it, you know, it's a multi-platform system that can pretty much run anywhere, et cetera. Um, but the great thing about Kafka is it does run on a shared nothing cluster of modest Linux machines. So 
when you do need it to go fast, um, you, you can exhaust the capacity of the three brokers in minimum, um, and then you add a fourth, and you get almost linear scalability and adding 25% by adding a fourth broker and a fifth broker and a sixth broker, etc. I can give you an example of a, uh, a, a user at this scale. So Agoda.com, who are the travel booking site, super popular in Southeast Asia, are based up in Bangkok. Um, these guys have been Apache Kafka users for about five years or so. Um, and I love going up to visit them and hear what they're doing because they're one of the best examples of event streaming systems in Southeast Asia. And they're probably one of the biggest in Asia, I would say. So they run their entire travel booking site using Apache Kafka. Everything feeds into Kafka. And you will notice that when you're on Agoda, it's a very busy system. It's doing a lot. It's making recommendations to you all the time. It's checking where you've traveled before, which hotels you're in, how many people are booking, where your friends have booked. All of these are stream processing pipelines that are operating in the background on events. Pardon the, I hope it's not too noisy. It makes a pile of um, So Agoda on an average day process 1.6 trillion events per day um, on, their, on their Kafka systems. So this works out as an average of 18 million events per second flowing through their Kafka systems. It's really, really a lot of data. Um, and that's, that's, that's an average. So during peak times, I think they easily go over 100 million events per second flowing through Kafka. So you can just imagine the scale that some of these systems run at. Um, and the, the thing about these is, somewhat unlike databases, this is exactly the same system that's doing 100 invoices per day. Okay, it's just got more brokers. The software release, the servers, the brokers that it's running on, the storage, it's exactly the same system, it just has more brokers. So when we talk about scalability for Kafka, it really is a horizontally scalable system. And so here's the full stack. Um, the Apache Kafka, the big box, is the sort of the core of the platform. You can download Apache Kafka from the Apache Software Foundation. Um, it, it comes in three APIs. I'll explain what those are in just a moment. Uh, install it, run it, run it on your MacBook, or if you're in production, run it on three Linux VMs, and off you go. Um, you will see the orange dots. These are the other open source or community licensed components that sit around Apache Kafka. Um, so these are generally called Confluent Community. Um, we license these separately from the Apache Software Foundation in order to give us different release cycles because Apache Software Foundation releases are heavily governed by committees. Um, and we wanted some more agility with releases for some of these products. So things like non-Java clients, a REST proxy, a schema registry, KSQL DB. Um, and these are, these, these used to, some of them are open source, some of them are community licensed. Uh, we, we, we changed some of the licensing terms for some of these last year, uh, but the, oh, the source code is fully available for these. And then finally, the ones with no dots are the enterprise features. These are the ones that we see uh, organizations that are running Apache Kafka having to kind of build themselves over and over again or get consulting companies or, or buying stuff off the shelf. So these are the, the commercial features that are sort of available uh, from Confluent. So I wanted to talk a little bit more about Kafka itself um, and the different APIs and how data flows through it. Um, the first is the Apache Kafka Connect API. Um, so when you download Apache Kafka, the, it's a JVM based application. So you get a bin directory a J, and a whole bunch of jar files for your Java libraries. And then you kind of run some scripts to start it up. Um, and it's, you know, it's somewhat sad. I keep seeing organizations that download Kafka and they love it, but they only start the brokers. They don't realize there are two other APIs to Apache Kafka that are part of Apache Kafka, like the open source. And it's been, they've been around for years. And the first Kafka Connect. Kafka Connect is solving the problem of the fact that the only way to get data in or out of a Kafka system for the first few years was by writing Java code, right? You had to deploy a Java application that used, the, that used the Kafka client and connected to the brokers and then ran commands to produce and to consume. Um, and this is, this is an, an inhibitor to the platform because not everyone wants to write Java and not everyone wants to have to deploy an application to do what may be a fairly simple data flow. So Kafka Connect was released in 2015, I think. Um, and it's basically, it runs on a VM. You start it up and it will connect to the Kafka brokers and you submit jobs. 
uh, and the jobs will set up permanent streams of data from source systems into Kafka or from Kafka systems out to sync systems. So the examples here are JDBC, which means any database, TIPCO EMS or MySQL, and some sync systems would be Elastic or Cassandra or HDFS and Hive, okay? Um, the, the, the sort of tagline for Apache Kafka is that you can create streaming pipelines without writing any code. You submit a job that has a long list of properties. So if you're doing it for a database, you will say, okay, my Oracle database host name uh, is here, my listener port is this, my username, my password, the schema, the database, the, the tables that I want to import, and then some properties that will express how you want to import that data. Do you want an incrementing feed? Do you want a timestamp based feed? Do you just want to do one bulk load and, uh, and, for, and, and not do any incremental? There's a whole bunch of options for doing this. Kafka Connect sort of makes all this easy. We're now up to about 108 connectors for Kafka Connect. Many of these, uh, I would say at least half of them are open source. They've been around for quite some time. Uh, another percentage of these are uh, released by software vendors for their own products. And, and another, and, and the final set of these are proprietary connectors that are, that are um, released and maintained by Confluent ourselves. So th the idea with Kafka Connect is that you deploy Kafka brokers, and then as you start thinking about the data that would be useful for event streaming across the organization, you, you, you create jobs to, create, to, to set up these streams. And Kafka Connect will look after all of the data translation from whatever type of source system to whatever type of sync system. So you could go from IBM MQ to Google BigQuery. Uh, you could go from Oracle to Postgres. Uh, a bank here does that uh, at very large scale. You could go from SAP to Snowflake, for instance. Um, and the difference between doing this with something like Informatica, which of course is capable of doing something like this or data stage, is that remember Kafka is a streaming system. So every database row becomes a message or an event. So if you start streaming for, say, an SAP table that contains, um, you know, a thousand vendors, um, it will do a bulk load of a thousand vendors, and then it will basically sit and listen to uh, call the source SAP system for new vendors. And every time a new vendor is created on the system, it will, uh, Kafka Connect will generate an event and produce it in. You'll have 101 messages in your system and that will trigger all of the downstream, downstream systems that are interested in new events. So it allows you to connect up systems that have got very different um, topologies or protocols or data formats, security schemes. The idea of Kafka Connect is it unifies all of this into a single framework to allow you to connect these systems up. The second, there are about uh, four or so of these. The second one is um, Kafka clients. So uh, Kafka is written in Java and Scala. Um, it's, it's, you run it as a JVM. It usually runs on Linux systems. A few brave organizations run it on Windows, but in most cases it's deployed on Linux systems um, or, or Docker or Kubernetes or VMs, whatever. Um, and not everyone is Java, so uh, Confluent also um, maintain and update clients. Uh, you know, .NET is super popular for the, for the Microsoft shops. Go is becoming increasingly popular. Python, uh, you know, has lots of traction among the sort of data science world. Um, and we do C as well, just because there's a lot of clients that use Kafka with C. Um, so these are all, these are all part of, of uh, the Confluent open source or community um, release. Uh, another important aspect of event streaming system is maintaining data formats and ensuring compatibility. So, you know, we've been talking, I've been talking a lot about moving data around as if this is a database system, about storing data inside the brokers, kind of like it's a database system. Um, but the reality is these are not insert statements. These are, we, we are producing messages into topics. And I think for the first three or four years of when Kafka was being released, when LinkedIn were using it, when various other systems were launching it, um, they were sending around message payloads that had no schema definition. So you're just sending, it could be a CSV where you just have comma separated value of text, could have been XML, um, but then some standards started to emerge. So I think JSON is the most popular standard at present, but a number of other standards such as Avro and Protobuf are now emerging as different schemes. So you can compare this with a data dictionary and a database. 
it's not possible to create a table in a database that has no columns and no data types. It won't let you do that. It requires columns and data types. But you can do that in Kafka. You can create a topic that has no schema definition, and then you can send in a message that is perhaps a payments message that has you know, 50 attributes. And then if you wanted to prove a point, uh, you, you could send in an invoice message into that same topic, and Kafka will take it quite happily. The first one's a payment, the second one's an invoice. Now, if you have an application that's consuming from that and it's expecting a payment and it suddenly receives an invoice, obviously that consumer is going to break and say, this doesn't look like a payment and it, it's not able to deserialize the message. So one of the trends that's emerged is that it's important to have message governance. Um, and the way that we achieve that is using a schema registry, which is another thing that runs on a VM and connects to the brokers. And it talks to all of the producers and consumers, all of the clients in the system. And basically you can enforce schemas for your messages if you wish to. And this is usually my first recommendation for any company that's looking at event streaming. I would, I, I tell them uh, uh, schemas are mandatory for all topics. And I, I, I generally suggest Avril being the, the schema format to choose. In a database, you don't get to choose a, a different data dictionary. So there's only one for each vendor. In, in Kafka, we actually have different data dictionaries, if you like, Avril Proto Buffers and JSON. Um, there are a number, uh, this, this might sound like a relatively simple thing and a bit of a dull moment. I mean, why would you allow, you know, what are the equivalent of binary large objects to be floating around with no governance? Um, but that's largely how messaging systems are built. That's how queuing systems have largely evolved. It's just a byte stream payload. Um, uh, but increasingly, I think largely because of these standards that have emerged on big data systems are now being applied to streaming systems as well. An interesting side effect of all of this is um, because you don't need to carry the schema in the message anymore, you can take the schema out. Um, you can just put in a, a marker to the schema, a schema ID, and it reduces your message size. So often just switching to a schema registry you can reduce your message size by 50% straight away. So the client will strip out all of the schema information, replace it with a schema ID, and send a message to the broker. Smaller messages means your system just has, has much more headroom to, to send data through. You use less storage, you use less network, all of these sorts of things. So this one really, really pays for itself. Schema registry is open source anyway. Um, so heartily recommend using a schema registry and either Avro or Protobuf, or if you prefer, JSON. Um, for, for all messages flowing through the system. Um, the next part is we haven't really touched on stream processing applications before. We've talked a little bit about microservices just consuming from an event streaming system and, and doing some processing and probably putting data back into the system as well. But that's not stream processing. Stream processing is actually um, uh, uh, processing a message as it moves through the Kafka brokers before you send it out to a consumer. So let me do an analogy with a, a, a Unix statement. Um, so if we're doing a cat of in.txt, cat of file, we're going to pipe it through grep to search for Apache. We're going to pipe it through sort minus n for numeric and then push that out to a file called out.txt. So let's pretend this is stream processing. So the two pipes here are Kafka core. These are intermediate stores. Essentially, what a, a pipe is an in-memory store where it, it basically serializes the data before it passes it into the next stage of stream processing. So in Kafka terminology, this would be a topic. Okay? And the Kafka topics are on the Kafka brokers or Kafka core. The next part are the two verbs, grep and sort. This is the stream processing. These are the commands that we want to do in order to transform a message from one format into a new format. And then the, 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 the redirect commands are like Kafka Connect. This is the ETL. This is where we're sourcing data in from Oracle and we're pushing data out to S3. Okay, so it's the same as redirects for a Kafka system. So um, to give you, this gives you an idea of the different components of a stream processing command. Um, the most recent component that's been released to a company, Apache Kafka, which is a confluent community is called KSQLDB. It's open source. It has its own release vehicle. So you can go to the, Confluent, uh, the KSQL DB GitHub page, download it, and you can run it on your laptop and connect to any Apache Kafka system. And this really, tr we're really trying to unify um, a lot of the concepts of stream processing so that you can do more to your message before it's consumed by your application. Um, if you're sending data out to a microservice and it has to do a whole bunch of processing logic on that, 
before it can really do something. And particularly if it has to do some processing and then push the message back into another topic for something else to pick it up and do some processing, you end up wasting a lot of cycles. So the idea of KSQL DB is we're making it easier to express streaming logic and ETL logic in a single platform. So it unifies stream processing and connecting and state stores into a single application that basically does is a processing engine for your, um, for your messages. The reason it's called KSQL DB is not because it's a database. I personally think it's a misnomer. I would have preferred KSelect because KSQL DB really just allows you to express stream processing logic using select statements. And you know, the, the reason everyone, we, we chose select statements is obvious. Everyone from kind of graduates to, to, to career professional, everyone knows how to write a select statement. Everyone comes across it at some point in their career. So three quick examples. And these are not queries, these are applications. Um, the first one was given to us by a bank in the US that's doing, uh, oh, actually the second one, I'll reach that in just a moment. So as you can see, we're doing a create stream, VIP actions, and we have a select statement, selecting the user ID, the page, and the action from Clickstream. Clickstream is a stream of events, probably coming from the web. We're doing a left join on users where the user ID in one stream matches the user ID on another stream. Um, and then we're filtering off where the level of the user is platinum, which, you know, which, mean, which is why we have a new stream called VIP actions. So there's a number of things in here that, that um, you know, everyone looks at this and you, your immediate thought is as a query. And I'm joining two things that are static in order to filter and return something else. But remember that these are streams of data. They are happening all the time. There is no, there's no table scanning. There's no index scanning happening here. Um, what it's going to do is it's going to, to examine events as they flow through the system. And when it, re when it gets two events that have the same ID, then it, then it basically does processing based on the statement. And it's doing some filtering. I'm um, just watching time, so I'll speed up just a little bit. Um, the second is anomaly de detection. <clears throat> and the difference here is we have a window tumbling command. And this is one of the differences between a database and a streaming system, time. So all streaming systems have to think about time. What is the window that I'm interested in for this? Um, and in this case, it's an, it, it, we're looking for fraudulent attempts to, to use a credit card. Um, if we have the same credit card number um, with three, uh, sorry, three or more authorization attempts within a five second window, we're going to emit to a topic called possible fraud with the card number and the number of attempts inside that five second window. Actually, there's a lot of logic in here. If you were to write this in Java, this is probably 20 or 30 lines of Java in, in, you know, by the time you pack it, package it all up and, and send it. And the idea of, of KSQL DB is to um, let you express this as select. Ultimately, there are three operations in select statements that are useful here. The first is a filter, and that's a where clause or a select clause. Both of these are filters. The second is an aggregation, a group by clause. So we're going to count or sum or average data as it's flowing through and then, and then send out uh, results for that every five seconds or so. Um, uh, aggregation and filtering and joining, the third is joining. Okay, so you can see I'm doing a left join uh, in the first one. So I'm joining two different topics together based on the keys of those topics. The, 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 um, the same, restrictions apply here that apply for databases. So it's very hard to do iteration and looping. In fact, it's impossible to do iteration and looping using a select statement. And the same applies for KSQL DB. So we're following the, the principles of select statements in order to build a lightweight language for doing stream processing on Apache Kafka systems. Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna rush through these a little bit faster because uh, I know people will have uh, be rolling over. So one of the complexities of these systems is how do you do disaster recovery? My, my, my advice on this is streaming systems should be treated the same as database systems. They should participate in DR tests. They should have the same standards for security, authentication, and access control. There are ways of doing disaster recovery for complex streaming systems. Um, there are a, a, you know, a bunch of different ways and, and you know, Confluent can both open source and um, proprietary. And, and the, the second point is, um, it's very common to, to generate events on-premise because that's where most core systems sit. 
but to require them on cloud because that's where many of the new systems being built um, are using cloud development platforms. And think of Kafka in this way like a shock absorber for data. You can, you can have Kafka systems running on-prem and a Kafka system running on cloud. And these systems are continuously exchanging events with low latency synchronization. And you're able to generate event-driven microservices on the cloud that are feeding events that may be generated from MQ or vSAM or ISAM-based IBM systems where we're doing change data capture. You can unify these two worlds. Confluent do actually offer a fully managed cloud system. So we, we will manage Kafka on your behalf. So we do it on um, GCP, on Azure, and on AWS in any region. Um, you simply tell us where you want to run your system. Um, in, for, you know, and Singapore is super lucky in that we have all three platforms available here. And then we will fully manage that system on your behalf and ensure that it's always on and it's always performing. So you don't have to worry about the administration for that. And finally, you can run it on Kubernetes. Uh, in, in, for many of our customers, VMs are being replaced by Kubernetes platforms and we're deploying Kafka systems inside pods rather than deploying Kafka systems on, inside VMs for both cloud and on-prem systems. Um, you know, and uh, I didn't really mention much about Confluent, but basically we're a, com we're a company that has, we're a one trick pony. All we do is Apache Kafka, we don't do anything else. So that's all that we are focused on. Um, and that's it, that's everything. So uh, Catherine will be helping me to share the slides afterwards. Um, if any of you have any questions about anything that I covered today, I'm very happy to take them. Um, I'm planning to jump in and have a look at the questions now. Uh, Richard, do you think I'm, I'm okay for time to look at the questions? Um, yeah, we are slightly over, but I think it's fine. Um, thanks for the very interesting uh, presentation, Mark. Um, I'm looking at the group chat window. Um, sure. There are a couple of questions. Um, shall I read them out? I know, it's fine. I have it right here in front of me. That's fine. No problem. Ah, okay. okay, so uh, Nicholas, thanks for your question. What's the advantage of using Kafka as compared to a microservice model? Um, they are complementary. So usually Kafka is used as the communication layer between the microservices because you need somewhere to store the messages and to trigger the microservices. So generally a microservice framework will sit uh, alongside of an Apache Kafka system. Uh, probably Spring is the most popular microservice platform that we see. Um, and it, it has a, 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 a very good Kafka client already built in that allows you to do a microservice based deployment using Apache Kafka. Um, uh, is, is Kafka complementary to ESPs? Yes, it is actually. Um, it, it might look like I'm talking about replacing TIBCO or replacing IBM MQ. I'm not. They are actually complementary. They do very different things. Kafka shares data. Queuing systems and ESPs distribute data. They're, they're different. Some companies struggle a bit with having both running and think you know, we don't need both. We, we have overcomplicated our architecture, but that's not actually the case. Um, ESBs are very good at what they do, and it's very common to connect an ESB to a Kafka system and then do all of the subsequent stream processing based off the Kafka system, which is receiving um, messages in real time from the ESB and converting them into events. And Nicholas, another question, how secure is Kafka for sensitive data? It's entirely up to you. Um, so we, we provide uh, all the tools that you need in order to set it up. So there's full, there's, there's full authentication and access control for the topics, just like having roles for a database. Um, there's full encryption for data in transit using a, a number of different uh, encryption options, uh, different authentication models such as SSL, Kerberos, uh, SASL, et cetera. All of these are available. And then when you move to cloud and fully based, there's a whole different set of standards that are available around protecting you such as um, tokenization of PII as data moves uh, from your on-prem systems into the cloud-based system, um, uh, encryption of data, obviously as, as it's sent between servers and clients, et cetera. Uh, security is top of mind for us for, for any system that we deploy. And that's all the questions. Uh, is there anything else? If anyone wants to ask a question um, and you still have time, then you're uh, quite happy to unmute and ask me now. Yep. Any question on the floor? Um, you can unmute yourself or you can um, type those questions in the uh, group chat. Okay, um, I guess uh, there's no further questions, right? Um, first of all, thanks. Um, oh, um, there's one question. Will you email the slides? Yes. 
So um, Catherine from the uh, SDS Secretariat will follow up with um, an email to everyone you know, um, with uh, the slides which Mark has shared. And in fact, uh, on top of the slides, you know, there will also be a link to download an ebook, which is uh, the definitive guide to Apache Kafka. So you, know, you guys will be able to assess uh, the materials right? so, uh, with that email. Yeah? Um, and uh, together with the email, I think we also need to uh, conduct a survey. You know, please give your uh, feedback um, to today's webinar. You know, we would like to continue providing you with more informative topics, you know, more educational ones to uh, help you understand the evolving nature of the, the technology and also what are some of the key trends and developments, right? So, um, all right, um, I would like to thank Mark and last but not least, uh, thanks everyone for taking time out to join us in this webinar. Hope, uh, you know, you all learned something today. Thank you very okay. much. All right, thanks. Bye. Everyone, have a good day ahead. Bye-bye.